Good afternoon, folks. I'd like to introduce the next panel, which will be moderated by Chris Jurgens. Chris has held leadership positions promoting cross-sector partnerships for global development issues, and he's doing that now in his role as the director of global programs, uh, or sorry, he's, he's done that as director of global programs in Accenture's development partnerships. Uh, now he's the division chief for global partnerships in USAID's new global development lab. And we're about to hear an important session where we'll hear about partnerships, uh, including uh, with the uh, private sector. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing from Chris and his distinguished panelists, who Chris will, whom Chris will introduce. Take it away, Chris. Thank you. Thanks very much, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be with you in the always coveted after lunch panel. Um, but fortunately <laughs> for you all, we have a very exciting topic to dig into and a really engaging group of panelists, all of whom are really leaders working at this intersection of the private sector and food security issues. Okay. Oh, and I think we're gonna start off with a short video. Agriculture is important to Ethiopia's economy as it supports over 80% of the population. There are over 8 million smallholder maize farmers in Ethiopia, and they are hindered by old generation seeds that have low yields. The Advanced Maize Seed Adoption Program, or AMSAP, is a public-private partnership that is increasing distribution of high-quality seeds and transforming the productivity of smallholder maize farmers. This is the story of AMSAP and how the new alliance has increased the yields and will increase income of smallholder maize farmers in Ethiopia. The New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition is a partnership between African governments, private companies, both local African companies as well as the international private sector, um, and donors to come together to lift 50 million people out of poverty by 2022. AMSAP, the Advanced Maize Seed Adoption Program, is one of our critical programs in Ethiopia under Feed the Future, and it's a, one of the major ways in which we contribute to the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition in Ethiopia. Some people have difficulty understanding the value of the private sector or new technologies or tools for the world's poorest people. But the reality is that small farmers in Ethiopia are trying to grow the same products as many farmers in developed countries like the United States. And those farmers deserve access to the same technologies and tools that other farmers have. <laughs> Kanakumtala <laughs> What we are seeing today here as an investment from DuPont Pioneer, which was a equivalent of $2 million, with a state-of-art seed conditioning facility, which does a seed cleaning, grading, treating, and packing, and as well as a, a warehouse, which can also store up to 4,500 metric tons. For DuPont Pioneer, we are mainly engaged in making available our hybrid seeds, uh, trying to give experience for farmers on demonstration plots, as well as also advising them the agronomy uh, packages and the agronomy management practices that should accompany our seed. In the past, we used to distribute seeds uh, or agricultural input in general through the cooperatives. But uh, with this program, we are uh, converting uh, the model farmer, the best farmer, or we call it pioneer extension farmers, to serve as a dealer. I, I think the best thing is if you talk to the farmer, the farmers will tell you more than I do. Hey, boy, Gary, the bar can dom. Why is Sanji cana want a? It is fire me want an argevi. And dom Sanji cana you aka umani na no ko aka sambita tani you. Kuno karsi baji sa sabin ya kapum tala kurani ma farangkasa si galigo chura samoran na sanji sa kuno akanat yu gurguranja mali faida matang kora kan kae umma tati yu gbeek sanja 
The AMSAT program started with 320 model farmers last year. It expanded to 3,200 model farmers this year and will sweep across the country to 32,000 farmers by next year. Innovation uh, comes from, from one individual or from a small group of uh, individuals. Therefore, we need to adopt and whatever works best from the private sector, from a non-governmental actors, and from all actors will be absorbed in terms of really transforming and enabling the, the, the partnership. As a result, we believe that the private sector has a big role in terms of technology access, in terms of uh, extension support, and particularly the seed and the technology uh, multiplication aspect is basically and will be driven by the private sector. Making improved seed available to smallholder farmers, particularly in maize, is an important part of Ethiopia's food security. Uh, the benefits of using improved seed not only result in higher yields and higher income for farmers, but there are also other components that come from using improved seed, such as better resistance to disease or even resistance to, to drought. So ultimately, using improved seed is a vital part of increasing the incomes and yields of smallholder farmers. The AMSAP partnership is actually a, a fantastic example of a very uh, well-functioning public-private partnership uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, AMSAP brings together one of the world's leading agricultural companies, DuPont Pioneer, uh, along with one of Ethiopia's most important development partners, USAID, to bring to fore a market-based solution for smallholder par farmers. At DuPont, we're collaborating at new levels. We have to. The consequences of hunger and malnutrition are so devastating so multifaceted that no one country, let alone one company or government, has all the answers. At DuPont, we're leveraging our science and the energy of our people to address the need to feed the world with particular urgency and passion. AMSAP provides a scalable model that takes a holistic approach of addressing food insecurity. I look forward to seeing how AMSAP continues to generate rippling effects to improve the lives of people in Ethiopia, one farm at a time. Madabara, it in Bitana, Calabanta, Gibiran Cafala, Terfacing or is in Bitana, Terfier Gandeva, or is in Bitan, or in Lecam Navale, or is in Bitana, Terfiva, yet it can make up the Vizgana and Wakayo Badi. One by year watching. Great. Well, I think this video provides an excellent framing for our discussion and, and dialogue here today, provide, providing a very tangible and clear example of the impact that a cross-sectoral partnership engaging the private sector can have and is having on the ground. And look forward to hearing a bit more about this example from uh, Lystra, our panelist from DuPont Pioneer. Um, but to kick us off, this audience knows well that private sector engagement has been a core focus area for Feed the Future from the start. In fact, last fiscal year, over 1,100 public-private partnerships involving private actors, governments, development partners were formed as a result of Feed the Future uh, assistance. Uh, and 80% of these involved local, small, and, and medium-sized businesses. And these partnerships have achieved results across multiple areas where Feed the Future is, is moving the agricultural development agenda forward commercializing new technologies, providing market access to smallholders, increasing opportunities for investment in key value chains, and contributing to policy uh, environments for, for investment. And, and many of these most successful partnerships, like the example we saw here, have been founded on the sort of core principles of good partnering with the private sector that we as an agency at USAID have learned over the last decade of starting with clearly defined and shared objectives implementing through an approach that involves shared responsibilities, shared risks, and shared rewards, uh, and really having core business interests at the heart for the private sector and development impact for smallholders and others, and, and balancing between these two dynamics. And it's that area where I think we want to delve into debate um, with this, this panel. Uh, so we'll have the opportunity to draw on diverse perspectives from the private sector, from the NGO community, from local stakeholders, from partnership platforms for, I think, a rich discussion, not only on the successes of partnerships, but any of you involved in doing this partnerships work on the ground know how hard and challenging it is. So get at what are the, the real challenges to doing this right. 
Um, so we'll spend the first time uh, in a discussion with our panelists and then hope to have time for discussion and questions with all of you from the audience. Um, but let's turn to our panelists. So let me start by introducing Lister Antoine, who's the Director of Agricultural Development at DuPont Pioneer, where she leads the company's sustainable agricultural development efforts globally, including DuPont's portfolio of public-private partnerships. Uh, she represents DuPont on Grow Africa, the New Vision for Agriculture Board, among other stakeholder platforms. And prior to DuPont Pioneer, uh, spent over 16 years at the World Bank, so has deep development experience. Um, so Lister, could you start off and, and talk briefly about how DuPont is operating at the nexus of uh, smallholder-driven agriculture and private sector investment, why this is important to the company? No, thank you so much, and, and it's a pleasure for me to be here representing uh, DuPont and DuPont Pioneer today. And so I'll take a few uh, seconds to do what I should have done earlier, which was to introduce that video to you, because it's a really uh, neat segue into some of the things that I wanted to discuss. And so when we think about how we approach agriculture development uh, through collaborative efforts, the video that you just saw, which is a collaboration between DuPont, Pioneer, and the government of Ethiopia, uh, particularly the Ministry of Agriculture and the Agriculture Transformation Agency and USAID, is an initiative that really looks at how do we get smallholder farmers to become more productive, how do we reduce uh, post-harvest losses, how do we build seed systems in these environments, and then also how do we build the capacity of the entire uh, value chain so that these smallholder farmers can not only provide more value to that chain, but they can also reap the benefits of more value. And so the, what you just saw was an example of a collaboration that has, has been working very well. As you listen to Khalid Bamba from the Agriculture Transformation Agency, as he reported in the video, this has been a, a partnership that uh, did not you know, it didn't come about easily, but I'll give you at least three reasons why we um, were able to actually get this collaboration off the ground, and it's certainly um, the basis for a lot of the collaboration that we do uh, in the public-private partnership space. And so the first thing I want to say is that as a private company, uh, one of the things that we found to be quite important is that we ourselves must set goals for ourselves in this space. And so DuPont in 2012 came up with its food security goals. And those are goals that we hold ourselves accountable for. And we've allowed uh, the public to hold, our, to hold us accountable for them as well. And those goals span three things. They talk about us um, investing over $10 billion in research uh, to provide 4,000 new innovative pr products in food and agriculture and nutrition products. We talked also about uh, engaging with youth, engaging with over two million youth, and then uh, engaging with rural communities, particularly smallholder farmers. And there we've set a goal of three million uh, smallholder fam uh, families and their communities, and all of these over the period 2012 to 2020. And so we found that when, as a company, we can hold ourselves and put ourselves out there uh, and have the public hold us accountable for achieving certain goals that are measurable, um, we found that to be one key ingredient. The second ingredient is really to work um, with other partners who hold uh, the similar objectives as we do. And so we found uh, USAID to be an important partner for us, certainly the Feed the Future initiative. Uh, in that initiative and based on the objectives of that initiative, we found that there's key alignment uh, with what uh, the Feed the Future uh, program aims to achieve and what we at DuPont uh, would like to achieve as well. And the third component really has to do with ensuring that as we design and develop programs, they are really very well aligned with the government's own development goals for itself. And, and that um, in Ethiopia, on that example, very early on we, we had discussions with the government we uh, determined that through the agriculture growth plan, maize was an important uh, crop, a priority crop for them. And so we, we designed the program with the objectives of the government in mind. And we also saw the, the, the farmer, uh, him and her, or herself, as a key stakeholder in the development of the program. 
And so we, DuPont Pioneer has been in Ethiopia for many years, and so we were able to actually talk with farmers to understand what their needs were as we developed the program. And lastly, as we developed the program, our view is that we must not only look at, at the farm itself and increasing the productivity of just um, farmers at the farm, but we recognize that access is one of the key debilitating farmers for smallholders, whether it is um, access to inputs, access to technology, access to finance, access to markets. And so as we develop these programs, we take a full value chain approach to try to ensure that farmers can, uh, from farm to fork, really have a system that works to support them. And so these are three of the things that we find uh, most critical. Great, thanks so much, Lystra. Great takeaways there in terms of those three foundations of transparent goal setting, partnerships, and host country government uh, ownership and alignment. Um, so let's turn to the far left to Arna Cartridge, who's the director of Grow Africa, the World Economic Forum, which is a partnership platform that seeks to accelerate investments and in change in African agriculture that many of you are very well aware of. Previously, you've served in leadership roles at Yara International, the, the fertilizer company, and, and other leadership roles at Telenor and, and CARE, among others. Um, so Arna, clearly, partnering is at the core of your mission and business model at Grow Africa. But so could you talk about what Grow Africa's role is in this space as a partnership platform, as you're called? Yes, thank you. Thank you. I would like just to turn the clock back 10 years. Uh, uh, in 2003, when the African heads of state met in Maputo, they decided we need to bring agriculture back as a priority for African governments. Um, I guess after 2008 and the food price spike and the Kila commitments, we got the development partners back to focus on agriculture. And we had 20 years where agriculture was really not prioritized in Africa. Um, but the private sector were lacking. Um, so um, President Kikwete, when the World Economic Forum um, hosted its uh, annual event in Dar es Salaam in 2010, said, I want agriculture as top of the event. That's a top agenda topic. The following year, uh, and based on an ask from the African Union and NEPAD, uh, where they recognized you know, they would not meet the 6% target of CADEP, for annual growth if they didn't bring in the private sector. And the ask was, could the forum, the economic forum, help and convene a meeting? And, and we had kind of a, reached out to, to kind of signatories, seven countries self-selected themselves, and we established a task force that later be, that year became Grow Africa. I think the ask initially was, can you help us create a mindset shift? Can we look at agriculture as a business, as an investment? not only as a development issue. Uh, and can you help us mobilize more investment from the private sector? So initially that was really you know, where we set out. Um, and um, your administrator was really also playing a key role at that stage. And later that year, as you prepared for the G8 uh, summit, the ask was, can Grow Africa team up with what became the new alliance? So jointly we mobilized I would say from late 2011 until May 2012, uh, approximately 3.5 billion US dollars in new commitments. And DuPont was one of those, those commitments in what is now materialized in your partnership in, in Ethiopia. Taha was another uh, of those commitments as a local uh, partner. We have since 2012 now mobilized more than 7.2 billion US dollars in commitments by more than 130 companies uh, and almost 50-50 now between domestic African-based companies and international companies. Um, Grow Africa is, is really just a tool and instrument for its partners. It's only going to be as strong as its partners is going to make it. Um, our role is to be a connector. Uh, and if, when we kind of entered this space or, or responded to the ask, what we found was a very fragmented, fragmented space. Uh, you know, all different states, so within governments, each ministries were running with their own different priorities. Different donors did the same. Companies was focused very much on, on their bilateral arrangements. Uh, same with civil society. So it was a clear need to connect the different stakeholders and to start building trust and start a collaboration. The other key role of Africa is to be a problem solver. 
identify what are the key gaps in these value chains. What are the things that is not functioning? Where do we need to improve policy? And to try to be very practical and pragmatic about identifying them, addressing them, and following up and reporting on the progress. Uh, the, the other part is also to be a knowledge, you know, how do we share best practices, both globally but also across the continent or within the countries. So we are trying to play that role of, of knowledge sharer. And then last but not least, the transparency. There's a need for increased transparency, sharing information, reporting, accountability uh, for all stakeholders, um, and also playing that role with the private sector. For Grow Africa, there are three main KPIs or, or key performance indicators. The amount of investments made or commitments converted. The amount of jobs created uh, and the increased income for smallholders. And what I think we find is, and it's somewhat often questioned by many, but I would say that the private sector as part of this process are truly serious and committed for the long term to find the right business models to engage with smallholders. How to make them more productive, more cost efficient, and how to make them benefit from what the market can offer. Great, thanks very much, Erna. I think it's a great example of a platform being, as you said, a connector, a convener, a problem solver, and a knowledge share and a facilitator in what was before a more fragmented market, so, so thank you. Um, let's turn to Jackie McKindy, who is the executive director of the Tanzanian Horticultural Association, or Taha. Uh, which is an apex body focused on promoting and developing Tanzanian horticulture across multiple value chains, flowers, fruits, vegetables, seeds, uh, and so on. Um, she's been instrumental, and Taha's been instrumental in a number of uh, public-private partnerships with both the government of Tanzania and a range of development partners. So, uh, Jackie, please tell us a little bit about your experience at the country level in Tanzania on this issue. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, as mentioned, I'm working for Taha, which is actually uh, an Apex private sector member-based organization. And we work towards supporting and facilitating horticultural value chain. And we work on the ground with farmers, exporters, processors, as well as other service providers, and also the government of Tanzania and development partners in ensuring that horticulture is in Tanzania is very well positioned. Where there are critical challenges, they are timely addressed, and also solutions are actually obtained in pushing the horticultural agenda forward. So we are actually the first local organization to sign um, an award grant with USID, and we are in, the, in our second year of implementing this um, um, project with, with aid and Feed the Future. And our activities are basically around, you know, as an apex private sector body, ensuring that the business enabling environment is conducive. And so we engage a lot with the government of Tanzania and also development partners in ensuring that policies are very supportive. And policies that are set by the government are actually in favor of hot cultural development, favor of farmers and, and other value chain actors. And where there are challenges, then we participate uh, in dialogue with the government and partners, ensuring that challenges are, are timely um, addressed. That is basically our core business as an industry association. But also we work on, on the ground in providing technical support services to farmers. And in this regard, we ensure that there is very, very strong connectivity between smallholder farmers and other value chain actors, making sure that we bring together all those who matter in hot culture development in Tanzania and across the board, and then we create and facilitate strong partnership or strong interfacing between the big and small as we build strategies around, uh, around the big and small holder farmers. And in this way, we are actually um, sure that the small holder farmers in question are able to gain uh, technology, but also they, are, they can access um, market in a, in, a, in a more reliable and sustainable, and sustainable manner. Other technical support services that we provide to farmers and other value chain actors include capacity development around good agricultural practices, but also we facilitate farmers to comply to local international as well as um, um, the, um, yeah, local and international market standards and requirements like uh, global gap and other market requirements and market standards. Logistics, which is actually another important component in horticulture, because when we talk of horticulture, you are actually talking about perishable commodities. So we uh, have a commercial wing, a business wing of Taha, which is basically an outcome of a USID-funded air freight project. 
And through this company, we are actually able to provide logistic support services such as tr uh, collective uh, tracking, uh, clearing and forwarding, and cargo handling in a most you know, reliable and in a more uh, affordable and also in a timely manner. Market intelligence services is also part of our support services to our farmers, because you can train farmers to produce and they can follow uh, all those uh, technical uh, standards that are required. But if they're not connected to the market, if they're not given the right information ab about the market, then the efforts are going to waste. So what we're trying to do all the time is to ensure that farmers are very well equipped with what is happening in the market. We are running a marketing and information system whereby we inform farmers of what is happening in the market through mobile technology and through other communication you know, uh, platforms. We also work with the government a lot in terms of establishing, mobilizing resources from the public, part, uh, our plug, public partners, especially the Minister of Agriculture and also the Minister of Industry and Trade in establishing market support infrastructure because this is very critical if we work towards you know, reducing uh, post-harvest handling losses, which is one of the critical uh, challenges facing smallholder farmers, especially in the rural areas. So we work with the government in establishing rural infrastructure that helps connecting farmers to, you know, uh, market at dif markets at different levels. So basically that is what we do. And the, 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 the lessons that we, we have learned so far is that, of course it requires partnership. There's no blueprint in bringing solutions to the many challenges facing value chain access. So it requires really an array of partnership working together, like what he has said, in a very transparent uh, and uh, in a, in a farmers working together, understanding each other, and partners also working together, understanding each other in addressing some of these uh, challenges in a sustainable manner. Great, thank you, Jackie. Again, a great example of a apex organization having impact at a policy and industry level uh, and at the level of smallholder farmers working in partnership. Um, so last but not least, let's turn to Chris Jochnik, who's the Director of Private Sector uh, Department at Oxford America. Uh, he's also the co-founder of two human rights NGOs and worked for over 15 years on issues of human rights development and <laughs> corporate accountability. Uh, and in addition, is a lecturer at Harvard Law School, uh, where he teaches a course on business and human rights. Um, so Chris Oxfam's played a very active role both in the advocacy space and the implementation space in, in, in this issue and the dialogue and debate around uh, engaging with the private sector on food security. Um, what do you see as Oxfam's role and, and key goals in this arena, and how do you balance those roles? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks for the invite. It's, I think the first time I've ever addressed a USAID crowd or event, and so it's a real pleasure for me. Um, I'm hoping most of you will know about Oxfam, but just a quick uh, two seconds on it. Oxfam, uh, is, it, Oxfam America is part of a larger Oxfam confederation. There are 17 Oxfams across the mostly in the north, some in the south now, and we have operations in about 90 countries. Oxfam originally started as a famine relief organization, and so these issues have been close to our heart, uh, issues of hunger and smallholder farmers for about 60 years now. Um, somewhere down the, the line, we recognized that um, handouts weren't gonna do it, and we adopted what we call uh, a rights-based approach, and that meant that um, we were really more concerned with addressing the fundamental roots of hunger, meaning that we needed to address policy issues, uh, we needed to address structural issues, uh, and so we developed, a, a, alongside our humanitarian work and our programming work, we de developed a, a campaigning uh, and advocacy line of work as well. Um, and as part of that, um, we were first focused on trying to change uh, government policies, and so we have never been willing to take USAID funding in order to be a little bit more independent and credible vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US government. Um, but we also recognized that the private sector was such a critical actor that we also had to address the private sector. Uh, when we were looking around in, you know, in, in the 60s and 70s at the private sector, uh, we didn't see a lot of good models for partnership and most of the communities we worked with were dealing with no private sector or a predatory private sector, and uh, we got our, our start really on the extractive side, and so most of our early private sector work was about pushing back on the private sector. Um, it's only really been in the last 10 or 15 years that Oxfam has also recognized, I would say in a more robust fashion, that we need the private sector in order to address uh, issues like poverty and hunger and to, to address the needs of smallholder farmers, and so we have also developed a line of work that's very much about partnering with private sector actors. And 
we've had this um, challenge of trying to balance the advocacy with the collaboration, uh, and we've done that one-on-one -on -one with companies. So we have campaigned against Starbucks, and we've worked with Starbucks, and we've campaigned against Unilever, and we've worked with Unilever. Um, but we've also done it uh, through multilateral platforms. So we've been part of the New Alliance platform. We're very active in the World Economic Forum. And we see those as really critical, uh, Grow Africa, of course. Um, but we also want to maintain a certain distance so that we can ensure that um, the voices of smallholder farmers and civil society groups are also taken into consideration. And I say one final thought on this. Um, our big concern really is question that go to questions of power. Uh, you know, we all know that there's enough food out there to feed everybody, and the reason that we don't think people are getting fed does not have so much to do with a lack of food itself, um, but a lack of access and the power to, um, to create opportunities and to get a hold of uh, employment or food or whatever it is. And so our lens on these issues that we're gonna talk about today is very much about the asymmetries of power between the large actors, the private sector, the governments, and the smallholder farmers that we're trying to support. And that question about any partnership is always front and center. Is this a partnership that is empowering farmers is it creating dependencies? Is it empowering other stakeholders? Is it creating more transparency and accountability? Or is it tending to benefit the already powerful? And is it exacerbating inequalities and elite capture? Great, thanks very much, Chris. Um, so, so picking up on some of your remarks, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't have a lot of examples of, of impactful public-private partnerships in some of these spaces, and now we do. Four years into Feed the Future, the collective experience of people in this room and beyond it. I wanna ask the panelists, what do you think are some of the most important things we've learned from this experience of building partnerships between businesses and smallholders and creating those linkages? And specifically, picking up on Chris's points around power and benefits, what do we need to ensure that the partnerships get the balance right, that they, they deliver benefits for the private sector and promote private sector development, but yield results and, and protect and empower uh, smallholder farmers. What are some of your experience and lessons learned from where you sit in this space? Arna? Thank you. Um, you know, as, as, as your uh, executive vice president, Jean Burrell said, I think it's, there's a recognition that no one sector, no one company or entity can actually resolve the challenges we are faced with alone. Uh, and it means that it also needs to be much more multi-stakeholder with approach. I think over the last 10 years, I think recognizing either if it's feeding a global population of 9 billion in the future, or it's addressing climate change uh, or other challenges, it needs to be a collective between public and private. Uh, and so I think we, we've, we've come a long way in recognizing that. Then it's, it's a question on how do we actually make it work? Mm -hmm. And that's much more, you know, challenging because it has to do with trust. You know, how do you get different self-interest to be aligned? Uh, how do you get that process to work? Uh, as you say, there's the asymmetry between, you know, big companies and small farmers. You know, how do you find a good balance of making that work? But I think there are some progress made, and I think there are some good examples, and there are some models out there now. I think what we need to see, okay, how can we build on those, and how can we take them to scale? And also, how can we speed up the process? Because what we look at now, at least, you know, and, and we have just this Grow Africa report for the last year uh, just out now, but I think what we see is that while there is progress made, it's not happening at the scale needed to be transformative. And it needs more collective effort to make that happen. What, what we found in terms of what, what actually works I think it's a recognition that um, while it's, you know, collaboration is important, but we've each got to recognize our strengths and, and our weaknesses. And so as we've worked um, on the ground, we found that we're very much able to deliver improved technology to smallholder farmers. We can bring the agronomic expertise, but more, more than that, if we look at what the, the public sector, for example, what they're capable of doing, uh, we, DuPont, commissioned the Economist Intelligence Unit to provide and prepare for us a food security index. That food security index that actually measures food availability, affordability, and safety across 107 countries worldwide, and it also employs a, a, a price adjustment factor, 
that um, index actually showed us a couple of things. And one of those things is that countries that are better able to um, perform along some of these uh, indices are those that actually invest a lot in research and development and countries that actually take care of uh, infrastructure needs. So for example, roads and ports and developments of markets, et cetera, and transportation. And so we found that where we're able to work well in our space, we have to recognize that for some of the infrastructure and some of the research needs, those we have to depend on, on governments to actually to, to do. And so someone mentioned before, I think it was Ani, the Maputo Declaration, you know, we're pleased to see that some countries are actually meeting the goal in terms of how much they should uh, invest from their GDP to, to the agriculture sector, though many more countries need to meet that goal. So the other thing that we've also found that's very, very useful is uh, listening to the farmers themselves. And um, many times, I guess, you know, sometimes one will think that smallholder farmers really uh, perhaps don't have much to offer. And many times as a, as a multinational company, one thing we hear a lot is that, you know, multinational companies are taking choice away from smallholder farmers. And in our experience, we're doing just the opposite. <coughs> We're providing farmers with information to make informed decisions about what they need to do on their plots of land. And even in this Ethiopia AMSAP work, um, those smallholder farmers are not obligated to use our seed year on year. But once they have experienced what a hybrid seed does for them, when they see their yields increasing, doubling, sometimes uh, you know, going close to tripling, they make choices themselves that previous to having the experience, they would not be able to make. And so we found that, you know, giving farmers and arming farmers with tools that help them to be more productive, that's where um, there's been a, a lot of uh, success. Great, thank you. Jackie, you nodded when Lister said listening to the local farmers. What have your experience have been some of the elements of success in these models? Yeah, building to on, on what uh, my two colleagues have just said, um, the important factor to consider is actually having the right tools, the right mechanisms, and the right way of communicating amongst partners. And this is how partners, whether it's uh, you are, you are, you're working with a smallholder farmer or you're working mm. with a big uh, investor or exporter, uh, if there is very good information flow amongst partners, then it will actually help to build mutual trust, you know, accountability for each other, respect, and also understanding. And this, in this way, partners will be able to actually achieve the overarching goal in a sustainable manner. But then one of the other important um, aspects that I've learned is actually understanding each other in a broader perspective. My working with farmers across Tanzania in mainland and Zanzibar has gi given me the opportunity to also understand that farmers are not the same. So we have really to uh, be able to understand the dynamics uh, amongst farmers and which varies from one place to another. This is very, very critical. So understanding the local position, the knowledge and experience and build our new interventions on the existing systems and structures will actually create a sense of you know, ownership, a sense of um, easy adop adoption of uh, innovation or technology as well as the sustainability. I always tell my people when they go to the field that when they go there, they don't go there as if they are coming from the moon, and they are just going there to invent things as if nothing is happening on the ground. This is what she has just said, that there's a lot of local knowledge and experience on the ground. And so what we are supposed to do, and this is what I stress on to my people every time they go to the field, is that they should actually be the culture of listening to and also respecting the local opinion. And I want to echo uh, a comment from IFAD uh, president uh, uh, last week uh, the, in Ethiopia when he said sometimes we development partners or facilitators as we go to the ground we think that you know development is done for the people but actually it's the other way around that it is the people doing it uh, for themselves so what I've learned is that we have really to uh, work towards building, you know, capacity, empowering partnerships so that, you know, there is that sense of ownership 
of the interventions that we, we implement on the ground. And also, uh, if, if we create that sense of ownership, then our, our, there's no, uh, that element of this partner is just a beneficiary of the program or project that I'm, I'm implementing. So that one is very, very critical. But again, when I mentioned the question of um, creating very, very strong interfacing between the small and big, uh, there's another very important element there of empowerment. If we want that, you know, interfacing between small and big to work and be sustainable, then it is very, very critical that we also enhance the capacity of this, of, of this uh, smallholder farmer so that they can actually transact business uh, meaningfully but also profitably with other uh, value chain actors across, uh, across the board. So these are some of the elements that I've, 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 I've learned. But another more important is that if we are talking of agriculture transformation, especially in our countries, is that it must be led and driven by the private sector and also enabled by the government. So again, it brings about partnership between the public and the private sector, working together towards achieving the common goal of supporting farmers and other value chain actors. That is how we can see and re re realize agriculture transformation. Great, thank you. Chris, comments <coughs> to build on that or add additional points? Yeah, um, so I, I think there are elements uh, in what everybody has said here that Oxfam would definitely share. Um, the way that I guess I have seen this from my limited window is that um, there was a lot of early energy in this space of markets and development to create partnerships between companies and farmers and a lot of those failed because they didn't really consider other parts of the value chain and so then there was a movement towards value chain linkages and inclusive development and um, that then didn't really work because they weren't really thinking about the broader ecosystem of policies and governance. And so there's now been a little bit of a movement around a more holistic approach to some of this stuff. And um, as Arnie mentioned, it starts getting very complicated because you get all these different stakeholders at the table and each comes with their different interests. And I would say that Oxfam then adds one further additional challenging layer, which is this question of, of power and whether you can just bring people to uh, these processes and, and expect that there's gonna be some kind of fair discussion or negotiation when there are these incredible disparities. So considering all of that, where we have seen some successes um, with partnerships, um, we've tried to push for uh, a couple of elements, and I'll just run quickly through them. One is making sure that there's a real commitment from the top from, and I'm talking really about um, partnerships with large companies. Uh, there's a real commitment from the executive level uh, to support smallholder farmers and that that really is part of the culture of the um, company and I think we're seeing a lot more of that certainly places like Unilever and Pepsi and Coca-Cola and Nestle and others have and Mars have shown that they, they are increasingly seeing the smallholder farmer as critical to their bottom line and they're willing to step up with those commitments. A second is, is a, a broader awareness of their impact so 10 years ago, Oxfam collaborated with Unilever on a study to understand what is the impact of a company like Unilever all the way from farmer to uh, distributor. And a lot of new things came to light about that that ended up helping Unilever change some of its practices in order to support uh, more farmers. And they realized that at the far ends of their supply chain, they were having enormous impacts and it really wasn't being taken into consideration in the kinds of decisions they were making. Uh, and so we've done this, these what we call poverty footprint studies with other companies, Coca-Cola, SAB Miller, uh, IPL, uh, a subsidiary of, of um, Walmart. And a, a third one is uh, this question of participation. So if you go into the other community, parallel to you folks, the, the uh, base of the pyramid crowd, they all talk about co-creation. And I, I think there's an element of that here. We don't use the word co-creation maybe, but um, the participation of the farmers themselves. So we've done um, a recent model, uh, project with Swiss Re, and um, the Ethiopian government, and some NGOs, and critical to the success of it, which was to develop a microinsurance product for small farmers, was that the farmers themselves were at the beginning of the story, and they were inputting into what kind of a product would really work for them. And that was really, it was only through their active participation in this that the, the, the final product really ended up working for those small farmers, and now we've scaled up, and we even have USAID um, engaging in some of that work, which is great. Um, a fourth one is the importance of third parties. So I think it's very hard for a company and a smallholder farmer or a cooperative 
to work out any kind of partnership without other stakeholders to ensure a little bit of balance uh, and, and, and bring in some additional insights and to support the farmers themselves. Um, and then the, the transparency of governance mechanisms is really critical, and I know people have talked a bit about that, but I think that's often overlooked. You know, we worked with the new alliance this year, and I think that transparency was given shorter shrift than it should have been. So there's a lot of talk about transparency, but transparency can be very uncomfortable uh, to, to the private sector in particular. We've started a large uh, this campaign called Behind the Brands, all about pushing more transparency in the food and beverage sector, and it's remarkable how opaque these supply chains are and how difficult it is to wrench simple information out of companies. Uh, and so, you know, the, the transparency to understand the supply chain, the transparency around what kind of a relationship that they are transacting with par business partners is really critical to any kind of accountability. Um, and then finally, the, the monitoring and evaluation, which goes to accountability. There, alongside the commitment to smallholder farmers, there has to be a commitment to actually evaluating whether or not uh, the impacts of any particular partnership are delivering the kinds of results and a willingness to share that evaluation and to include the, um, the, the beneficiaries or the stakeholders or the partners in the evaluation so that they can be, um, you know, they, they have a real voice on whether this is working for them or not and that will then lead to hopefully um, better decisions and more accountability. So those are some of the elements we would look for in any kind of um, partnership. Great, great. I, I think between the panelists we're printing a rich picture then of some of the key success factors to make this work, Arnie, talking about everybody needing to be around the table from the start, uh, Lister speaking to those players, then playing to their core competencies and looking for partners where they don't have those competencies. Um, your point, Jackie, about in that process, making sure we're listening uh, and having good communication platforms and processes to make that, that all about and, and empowering stakeholders. Uh, and then Chris, a number of your points around the importance of, of co-creation of leadership and then in implementation transparency and accountability so we're measuring what's working and can play that back into the communications and, and course correct as needed. So uh, I think a great story there. If we go from partnerships now to one of the domains where Feed the Future is particularly focused on cross-sectoral collaboration in terms of uh, policy um, and particularly the importance of policy change to improve the business enabling environment to allow uh, investment to take place uh, and increase capital flows into some of these sectors. Clearly, it's important to improve the private sector environment for growth, but it's also equally important these policy reforms to protect uh, and promote the interests of smallholder farmers. Uh, I'm wondering, similar to the last question, if, if the panelists could provide perspectives on, on what are the key um, factors and elements to, to make that work and, and get that balancing right in partnerships that, that are tackling policy issues. And maybe, Chris, start with you this time. Okay, well, um, as a human rights guy, this is uh, really my, my, my sweet spot, I guess, um, because we, we want to be all about policy change and um, broader systemic change. Um, and uh, what we've done at Oxfam when we've thought about this is we have looked to the corporate partners in these collaborations to be uh, champions for the kind of policy reform that we think is critical. And, the kind of policy reforms that we think are important are not only about facilitating businesses, and I think there's a lot of policy reforms on facilitating businesses that are absolutely critical, but also the policy reforms that will address some of the um, uh, inequities uh, or, or you know, marginalization of smallholder farmers, for example. And so we want to see issues of land rights, um, and we, we talk about free prior informed consent, for example, women's rights, um, labor rights, we're as, uh, I would say, as, as um, obsessed with those kinds of rights as we are, and I'd say, or as others are about the kinds of regulations that will facilitate business. And where companies are very comfortable with the latter, uh, that's to say they're very, you know, they're, they have policy shops that work on things like intellectual property or taxation or, or easy registration of their businesses. Um, they're less comfortable talking about these other issues. And I think it's a real litmus test uh, when working with partners to see whether they really are willing uh, to step up on some of these other issues, um, corruption and clean governance also, um, but the land rights. And to give you an example of this, um, as I mentioned just a, a moment ago, we launched this campaign called Behind the Brands and we focused on the 10 largest food and beverage companies. And we wanted to look at the impacts of their supply chains on smallholder farmers and women and other constituencies. 
um, and we scored them. Uh, and we made that very public, and we got the consumers and others and investors to engage with the companies. And then we went to them with certain asks. And first we focused on gender, and we said, uh, we looked at out across the cocoa supply chains, because that was a good model, and we said, Nestle, Mondelez, Mars, you have 40% of the cocoa market. Women are very badly treated in this market. They can't own land. They don't get access to the extension services. They're poorly paid. We want you to do the studies that distinguish how women are treated. We want you to make commitments to women equality. And we want you to be public champions. All three of the companies, after two months of campaigning, stepped up and said they would do that. Then we moved on to land. And we went after the sugar industry. Uh, which is a commodity that has a big land footprint and, and that consumers can understand more than palm oil or soy, for example. And we went to Pepsi, Coke, and ABF, Pe Coke being the largest sugar um, buyer in the world. And again, we said, um, we, want, uh, we, want to we want to know and show. We want to know what your impact is on land conflicts. We want you to show the, the incidence of land conflicts in your supply chain. So we want, and we want you to disclose your suppliers of sugar. We want you to make a commitment to zero tolerance for land grabs and put it into your supply chains, so free prior informed consent for all your suppliers. And we want you to be a public advocate to actually force governments to step up on land rights. When we went out and talked to experts and others in the field, they all said, maybe you'll get one or two. You'll never get a company to say land grabs or zero tolerance. Or, uh, it, within six weeks, Coke came around. They said, OK, zero tolerance for land grabs. They put in the supplier codes. They said, we'll do the studies and we'll make them public, and they said we'll be a public champion. And last week at the UN uh, gathering on the voluntary guidelines for responsible tenure, Coke was there being a public champion for land rights and free prior informed consent. For our money, that's absolutely critical. We, don't, uh, we can't just allow companies, in, in our view at least, to go into these partnerships without exercising all of their different levels, levers of influence. That means their political levers, their marketing, uh, as well as their financial leverage through the supply chain. And, and we think that that can happen, and it's in the long-term interests of these companies. Great example. Yeah, talking of, um, uh, talking of um, business enabling environment, from a thorough you know, analysis of uh, what is happening in our countries as far as business enabling environment is concerned, we have come to realize that there are quite a number of shocks that affect the, the business community. And one of the shocks is actually unstable business, in, 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 unstable business environment, which is mainly attributed to unstable policies and also sharp transition between policies and also inefficiencies and complexities of the systems, rules and regulations, but also complexities of the people that we work with. So as an organization, we have made it to understand that it is high time that we reconfigure or restructure our ways of doing business, our ways of engaging with partners in a way that we are working all the time to have the right tools in place, the right you know, systems to identify issues on the ground and also provide timely solution to some of these, of these critical challenges facing farmers as far as biz or value chain actors as far as business and environment is concerned. We are also working towards building our internal capacity, especially advoca advocacy capacity, so that we are able to mobilize and use partnerships to solve some of these problems. And when we talk of partnership, we don't just look at you know, looking inside the box, but we go beyond the, border, the, the boundaries of Tanzania. So we mobilize partnership right from local, uh, regional partnership, but also international partnership. And the expertise that we mobilize out there is actually building our internal capacity so that we are able to engage with our governments, but also engage with our development partners and other partners in solving problems. And also engage meaningfully and also proactively, not only actively, in addressing some of these issues. And when, when I talk of engaging with the government, we, as much as we, we are trying to actually build our own internal capacity so that we are able to articulate issues with confidence, mm -hmm. with stability, with clarity, and with high level professionalism as we build win-win advocacy mission between us and the, and the public sector. But this actually depends very much on how we master our communication strat strategy and our communication style with the constituency that we, we represent. My organization, for example, is actually representing three levels of membership. 
we have comprehensive who are the big players in the industry. Then we have allied members who are service providers like agro input dealers and associate members who are smallholder farmers. Most of the time, the advocacy needs, demands, and priorities of these members are not the same. So that is one of the challenging factors that we have learned to actually go about it. And so what we are trying to do is actually to come up with um, different style and mechanism of engaging with the different levels of membership as we address their advocacy issues. With the smallholder farmers, for example, the way we engage with them is actually different with the way we engage with big guys. So we go, we identify issues from, our, from the ground, from the farmers using their leadership. And this again calls for our capacity to mobilize these farmers into formal entities for easy access. Not only mobilizing them into formal entities, but to build their capacities, build their leadership capacity, so that leaders in the, in the farmer groups can also be, can serve as conduit of information between the farmers and the apex body. So that is one of the, 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 the initiatives that we take on the ground. Again, we engage other platforms like marketing information system. So we have more than 15,000 farmers who are actually directly registered into our system. So if there is any way that there's an, an issue that we want to uh, uh, maybe receive feedback from our members, we would actually use mobile technology to engage with them and get feedback from them. Another way is actually interactive session. This is a strategic way of actually hearing from them and getting feedback on what is happening on the ground and whether the advocacy work that we are doing is actually impacting on them directly or whether they understand what we are doing at the national level, regional level, or, or international level on their behalf. So that is very critical. But then when we talk about of advocacy, then it is very important also that we um, understand and appreciate the role of our government. Uh, strong leadership, commitment, and support from the government in ensuring that the environment is truly enabling and we are having a critical mass of people in the system with, you know, enabling mindset, attitude to support the business community in our, in our countries. But then having, uh, you know, our government striking a balance between the two key roles of the government the enforcement role and trade facilitation role sometimes is a challenging factor. So it is again a question of building the capacity, not only of the private sector organization that are engaged in advocacy, but also the government institution, especially, and when we talk of government capacity building, we normally tend to think that we will target only central government. But local government authority, for example, these are the theaters where these policies that are said by the government are being dissected and enforced at that level. So capacity building, that right at the local government level is very, very important so that policies are being enforced as tools to facilitate trade and not just tools to enforce rules and regulations. So what we do in that regard is we engage a lot with the local government authorities. We try as much as possible to cre create a critical number of our champions in the government system, right from the local to central government authority, work with them, feed them with information about what is happening in the industry. So at the end of the day, they become our ambassadors in pushing the agenda forward. So those are some of the strategies that we actually implement to ensure that we are implementing win-win strategy for the industry to survive and thrive. Great, great tangible examples at the global and the, the country level. Maybe turning to Lister and Arda for some brief observations on this private sector perspective. I'm told we have about 10 or 15 minutes left, so some brief remarks here and then leave a few time for, uh, some time for a few questions. Okay, so maybe um, one of the things, just answering your question about what it is that the public sector actually does and can do to support um, mm. these, these partnerships, I think what we've seen is that um, the public sector has to provide that enabling environment for science-based solutions to work in their environments. Within DuPont, we like to say that science is global, but solutions are local. And so as we think through how do we deliver on the ground in countries, in regions, it's really important that countries have that enabling environment to support science-based uh, solutions. And that goes from you know, predictability on policies. We talk a lot about harmonization across Africa in the, in the major trading blocks. We know that because of the fact that goods cannot move across borders in Africa, um, there's so much loss that takes place at these borders. And so as we look at how governments can facilitate more of that, that's very helpful. 
The other thing is that governments need to be able to support the very vulnerable in their communities. And those vulnerable ones are generally women who are usually uh, have the least access to what's needed, whether it's access to land, land rights, to technology, to finance. Um, they usually have the least access. So how do you support? How do governments have these um, supportive policies to support women and children? And even as we look at that, um, where do we as the private sector support getting science-based solutions and pro-poor solutions to smallholder farmers? And there, DuPont recently actually um, engaged with the World Agroforestry Center to support uh, evergreen agriculture where we're supporting the planting of trees in between our maize uh, for smallholder farmers. And we see it as a pro-poor solution to smallholder farmers, their ability to actually rejuvenate and be conscious of their soils, but also uh, uh, expend less on, on inputs as they, as they farm. And lastly, I think one of the things that governments can do is actually that availability of information to provide that to smallholder farmers. And whether that means partnering with others to provide that, um, but however that, that availability, whether through actual um, access to information, but also the analysis of key data so that when that analysis is done, the impact or the, the key bottlenecks are identified and then they can actually make uh, policies that actually address those key areas that can be done. Uh, give a couple of examples. I mean, one is you know from the seeds. You know, if, you know if you have an approved seed in Kenya, why should it take three years to approve the same seed in Tanzania? Why could not that be done in one year? So there's a lot of things that can be done on the enabling environment. Give another example. Um, together with Monitor Deloitte, uh, funded by, by by USAID, we did uh, in Rwanda two years ago uh, an assessment based on their strategy plan. And potatoes, Irish potatoes, was a key crop for them and they wanted to become a regional hub for potatoes, also exported to the DRC and other places. We asked the private sector, there was hardly any interest. So one is how do we then bring the private sector to the table? And okay, we've been able to facilitate that process and then going all the down different steps, we need a coal, coal storage. The coal storage, we found an investor. The, the investor said, okay, the upfront investment is not the issue, it's actually the operational cost. Energy tariffs in Rwanda is three times higher than in Kenya. So how do you then address, so you get down to the specific levels and how do you improve the enabling environment? Another issue is rice in, in, in Tanzania. So you have, you incentivize local production at the same time you open up for import, uh, which will totally undercut your local producers. Okay, do you need to put in tariffs then or how do you then cre you know, create the transparency? So there's a lot of things that needs to be done on the enabling environment, creating more predictability, transparency, and buying down the risk. Uh, I think the other side is what you say, you know, is the rights aspect. You know, how do you make sure that the interests of different, you know, say, smallholders or the rural communities is protected? And land is obviously one key area of that, you know. So that's another area that we need to really focus on. Uh, and also have then a multi-stakeholder engagement in that, that type of process. Then I think, as, as Oxfam mentioned, I think it's what I would call more voluntary practices, you know, guidelines. And then you need pressure groups like, you know, Oxfam and others to push on those guidelines. Uh, but companies, I think, want to step up, uh, but potentially need some guidance and support or some push in, in that direction. So those were the three buckets, I would say, enabling environment, the rights of, of vulnerable or, or rural communities, and the more voluntary guidelines type of, of approach. It's a great framing for the different examples we heard uh, across the panel. Um, so thank you to all of you. Uh, in the time remaining, can I open the, the floor to a few questions? <coughs> we only have a few minutes left, so would like to gather maybe three or four questions from, from folks at once and then give the panelists a chance to, to respond. So I saw one hand over here. I think roving mics will coming around. Um, please introduce yourself and uh, uh, state your, your question succinctly, please. My name is uh, James Woody and I work for USAID Haiti. My question goes to Chris. Chris, uh, let me first tell you that I'm a former Oxfam and a former Action Aid employee, so I fully understand the role of uh, civil society and advocacy for development in, gen in general and for the Feed the Future program. I was pleased to hear your comment about balancing advocacy and collaboration. However, in the field, some of Oxfam's partners 
are more or less radicalized, and they think that uh, USAID and the private sector we, we're partnering with are the enemies that want to hurt the small farmers that we actually want to, want to support. Uh, and this attitude prevents them from effectively working with us uh, in, in our program. How does Oxfam see working with its local partners to help them move past these, pre these preconceived ideas that prevent them from effectively working on behalf of the farmers? Okay, thank you. What are two more questions? See a hand over here? Oh, yeah. Okay, right. I'm Bill Bradley from USAID Cambodia, and I just was uh, wondering if uh, some of the panelists could talk a little bit about how, I mean, what, what would the role of the private sector be in promoting integrated pest management and safe use of, safe use of farm chemicals, and if, is that in the interest of, of a larger uh, company like DuPont? Great, one more. My name is Harriet, I'm from Feed the Future Tanzania, and mine is really um, to private sector in terms of uh, trade facil facilitation because most recently we had the uh, Bali Ministerial Conference where our governments signed on to, um, you know, committed to a number of reforms towards trade facilitation. And just reading through that document, I didn't quite see private sector engagement uh, in informing some of, I mean, the decision that the governments took in signing on to those commitments. So my big question is, what are the implications for Africa in terms of trade facilitation? And you as private sector, what does, I mean, what, what do those uh, uh, commitments mean to you? Are you facilitated enough to engage in profitable trade um, according to what your government has um, signed on to, committed to undertake, and uh, I mean, uh, when we look at the situation on the ground, that we, we have a lot of, um, a lot of um, um, constraints to trade in terms of infrastructure, in terms of our ports, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the implications for Africa in terms of trade facilitation? You as the voice of the, of, of the farmers and private sector advocating to the government in terms of what should be happening on the ground. Thank you. Great, thank you, great question. Uh, could we get one more then? There's one here. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Alin Fall, I'm the Director General of the Agricultural Research System in Senegal. And I guess we need to maybe talk about more about the, the PPP, the partnership, private, you know, public-private partnership. Uh, I guess still we need to explore and explain more so we can all understand uh, all what is behind all that partnership. Uh, I, want, I want to be very clear on that uh, because I'm going to ask the, the panelists, uh, where do they place farmers' organization in that partnership? Uh, because in some countries you do have very strong farmers organization who can capture any type of policies, uh, you know, coming from the government and, and behaving like private and not being pri in the private sector. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> do we co have to, maybe I can ask Jean-Michel to talk about it, you know, because you, if you talk about the, the seed production system, so all, most of the multipliers, you know, to certify the seeds, mostly are farmers' organizations. They are not the private sector. And we, we are talking about how we can promote private enterprise, you know, to, to produce seed, quality seed to farmers. And, and if you look at all the actors behind the seed production system, they are all farmers' organizations mainly. So when we are talking about private, public, and private partnership, do we have to consider farmers, those big farmers' organization as private, uh, or just to consider their farmers, you know? Uh, it's very important because uh, I'm the head of a, a public institution. 
uh, everybody is making money out of the technology we are generating except ourselves. Uh, if we are, when we are producing new varieties, pe people then multiply the varieties, they make money because they're selling them to farmers. When we are bringing in new machines like harvest, you know, to, you know, to, to improve harvest, uh, people are multiplying the, the machine, selling it to, we don't make money because we are concerned as a public. But all those on the line uh, taking advantage on those technologies, if they consider themselves as private, they should have a return to, to research so we can have enough, fine, you know, uh, f enough funding for the research to be sustainable. Only the government is financing research. Right. Because they say this is the public sector, so the, the, the government is financing research. So we should now, in this partnership, private, now private sector should be financing research so we can you know, have you know, good innovation. Thank you. Thank you, great questions. If I could ask each of my panelists to give a, a, a brief response, just a, a minute in the time we have left on, on one more of those, that would be great. Please start off, Chris, with the Oxfam question. Um, I, I love that question, uh, and I get it a lot, actually. Um, I know that the world of civil society groups is quite um, vast, and that there are many at the far end of one spectrum who really have no interest in collaborating with companies. And I, I will say a, a part of me goes out to that crowd because I understand where they're coming from. I spent seven years in the Amazon fighting oil companies. I think many groups on the ground uh, have a valid reason to be suspicious of private sector companies um, having seen the, you know, the predatory behavior over the years and not really enjoying much by way of rights or security from the government, government in Africa, I think less than or 10 percent of the land is titled formally, so you have communities that really are living on the margins, and it's understandable that they will be skeptical. That said, um, we believe you got to, first you got to start with their voice. If you're going to really believe in participation, you got to let people talk, and you got to let them make their own opinions. So Oxfam would never push one way or the other. When I first collabor did a, a project with Coca-Cola, we were, and it became a public partnership as we insisted it would be, uh, we got hit all over the head from all our Latin American colleagues for working with Coca-Cola, and we said it was still worth it. When we then pushed Coca-Cola to come out on land rights, those same groups have either been silent or supportive. And I, I think um, the, the, the lesson for me is companies can win over communities, maybe not every community and maybe not every, every civil society advocate, but they have to be, it takes time and you have to really understand where those groups are coming from. It can't be a, a, a simple transaction of trust building. It has to be a two-way street where the company really is putting itself out there and, and taking steps that are perceived as legitimately groundbreaking. So real commitments, real transparency, uh, a real push uh, on, on different rights is the only way that I think that companies can win over uh, skeptical civil society groups. And again, you'll never win them all over, but at least you can win a significant part of that. And I think with that, you can create partnerships. Great, thanks Chris. Yeah, responding to the issue of IPM, how we take IPM and safe use of chemicals, that is actually part and parcel of our technical support services that we, pro we promote and, for, uh, and we use uh, on the ground with our farmers. And I'll give an example of the IPM. We are currently working, for example, with the Ministry of Agriculture in Tanzania in actually introducing what you call biolo biological control agents for use by our vegetables and flower growers in the place of uh, the, the, the normal chemicals. And also we are working with the ministry in actually establishing what, uh, a system, a streamlining a system of registering these uh, products so that we have as many as possible of the biological control agents registered for use by the industry practitioners to reduce the levels of, of pesticides that are used by the farmers. We don't end there, but we also incorporate the issue of capacity development on the safe use and handling of pesticides. We have manuals, we facilitate accreditation, and we also work with PRI, which is an, a government institution, to ensure that the maximum residual, residual levels are adhered to by industry practitioners. Talking of the responding to the, uh, the, the, the comment on uh, trade facilitation and what is our, our, our comment on uh, private sector involvement, I would agree with her that there's not been much consultation between the private and the, private, uh, and the public sector in the area of you know, uh, reviewing or formulating the, the, the agreements, protocols, and also frameworks that are there to facilitate trade. A few days ago, I, I was in Nairobi, and I was actually participating in a process of inputting on uh, 
the Bali Agreement um, review by government and, and private sector. Being in that meeting, uh, I was surprised on the, 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 the level of, uh, that the, our government has taken and also other governments in Africa has taken in actually uh, implementing <coughs> the Bali Agreement, for example. And as from the private sector, some of us, we are hearing that protocol or that agreement for the first time. So it requires enough capacity from the, the public and also the private sector to get to know what is happening around trade facilitation issues. Not only the question of understanding, but also breaking down some of these frameworks, protocols, and also agreements into simple tools that, that can work so that our farmers can make use of these tools to seize opportunities that are brought about for this agreement. So we need more consultation and capacity building around that. Great, thank you. Let me just quickly address the points that were raised on, uh, on actually getting um, what, what do we do in terms of safe, safe use of farm chemicals. Uh, DuPont Pioneer Crop Protection is very uh, keen to ensure that there is safe use of chemicals and that, that our uh, protocols are even uh, they adhere to the very strictest uh, standards. So, and even sometimes we go above and beyond those standards in the applications of some of our, of our products. So I'd be happy to talk with Bill about that uh, separately. In addition, when we talk about um, the role of farmers' organizations, um, we see that they are very important. We work with farm organizations and, and cooperatives uh, through our programs. Um, and uh, to, to just uh, confirm, where we partner, I mean, we partner with everyone, even on the Ethiopia program, we're working with um, farmer groups, we're working with cooperatives, we're working with an N NGO, uh, ACDI VOCA on implementation. So we try to ensure in this collaborative space, there's really no end to our ability to collaborate and, and, and with whom. Um, the other thing is, um, the other question about how do we, um, the constraint to Africa trade and facilitation and what are we in the private sector doing you know, on that question, we actually work with and through our associations uh, to really um, strengthen our voice. So we work along with others, whether in the seed sector or whether in the food and agriculture business, but we use our, our membership through associations to really have a say in those uh, discussions. And we know, for example, even a study that came out in 2013, I think from the bank, that actually quantified the losses that result from uh, the barriers across uh, barriers to trade from all of the different um, all of the different borders, and so that those th the cost is in the billions of dollars. And so, as a private company, we are very interested in seeing uh, harmonization of policies and certainly more access to free uh, trade around uh, not only in the continent but but globally where. Um, where Africa is. Yeah. Final and brief word. Yes, since Pam has been showing the f uh, end sign for the last five minutes, I'll be very quick. So I have one, 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 one comment, and that is on the, on the farmer side. So uh, I think you know, if, if I ask Chief Obanja or, or Philip Carrero or Ismail Sunga, uh, heading up some of those regional or, or, or uh, you know, farmer organizations, they would define themselves as private sector. Um, and we relate to them as private sector. So for the Grow Africa partnership, they are fully integrated into our process as private sector and need to be at table as, as, as that type of stakeholder. Great. Well, excellent discussion. Please join me in thanking our panelists first and foremost for...